Welcome everyone. It is so nice to see you again. Uh, we're going to get started in five minutes after the hour. So it's gonna be about four or five minutes from now. Um, for those of you who sent me emails, as always, thank you so much. And I guess before we get started, it's been a very interesting week. Does anybody have any comments whatsoever on the current state of democracy in America? And we call it election week now. Uh, can you say that again, please? Can we say election week? <laughs> yes. Let me just check one thing. My audio sounds very, very jumbled. So I'm actually curious if I'm the person responsible for that. Kristen, I have a question. Um, that last participant, were you able to hear them clearly or was there distortion on your part? Okay, uh, nod your head if you can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I was able to hear you. Okay. Um, yes, I think I heard that this is a comment referred to election week. Please call it election week. It was a little bit distorted, but I was able to hear him okay. All right, uh, Matthew just said, Kristen, you sounded distorted. Um, Kristen, you sounded distorted to me as well. Um, I guess as long as you're able to hear me clearly, I just want to make sure. Can everyone hear me okay right now? If you could just reply in the chat. Excellent. All right, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who might be having a little bit of distortion or interference, please don't be discouraged. We still want you to be a part of our discussions today. Uh, Kristen, yourself as well. I mean, you own it, you're in charge. So um, like I said, in about uh, one or two minutes, we will get started. Uh, we have about 17 people on this call. Kristen, if you can believe it, um, on election day, I was on, no, the day before election day, I was on several Zoom meetings with a thousand people on there. So I know, so I want you to know that it was a baptism by fire. I've never done that before, but it did give me good experience. So I want you to know that we could have as large an audience as we want with these meetings. So I want you to know that if we decide to maybe appeal to, um, if we want to broadcast more nationally that uh, the Bethlehem Public Library is offering these things, um, I now know the procedure of what to do if we have participants in the hundred. It is actually very interesting what to do in that case. We just need a volunteer to be a chat moderator in that case. That is how you handle it. And hopefully we won't have any spies if we do. But it was very interesting. But as I said, um, I mean, as I was um, remarking, uh, see one minute until showtime. Um, as I said, we just went through what many people have described as, uh, all right, Kristen, no problem. I'll be right over here. Um, Kristen, I'm co-host, so I don't think it's going to affect anything if you leave. Uh, just so you know, we have lived through what might be, um, at the very least in my memory, the most intense election in a lifetime. Does anybody have uh, any comments or any reflections on what we just lived through or are still living through with respect to Tocqueville's text? Uh, let's see. Kristen wrote, actually, might end it all together. I'm going to stay put and stick to chat. All right, not a problem. Totally understood. I'll be right over here. Um, let me just quickly check one thing over here. Um, just looking at the participants that we have. And let me just make sure there's no distortion going on on my side. So. Okay, this works. All right, um, Kristen, if uh, you do want to take another stab at any of the audio, please don't be shy. I'm pretty sure I can understand what you're saying, so I have no problem repeating anything. Any better? It's a little bit better, but it's still probably gonna be difficult for anyone who's hard of hearing. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you. And I guess we'll get started. Everyone, thank you for being here for our fourth and final discussion on Alexis Tocqueville's Democracy in America. This is a program that has been made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm sorry, the National Endowment for the Humanities through Humanities New York, which is the New York branch of it. We are being hosted by Bethlehem Public Library. And of course, Kristen, I'm so indebted to you. Thank you so much for this welcome to be over here. 
Um, if you have any information for our participants whatsoever about future programs that the library will be offering, please feel free to drop them in chat now. Interrupt me at any time if there's anything um, timely that uh, you would like to share. And uh, because we do have a little bit of technical difficulties, I will get started. Thank you so much. So again, your emails. And Kristen, I wanna say, I would like to do this from now on. I definitely think it's a good idea to have some of our participants' emails. So I'm enjoying this. So the one email that I received that I would like to share, it opens with a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville with respect to revolutions. And I have the passage right over here. Of course, thank you, Humanities New York, for uh, sponsoring these programs. And everyone, I do want to make it very clear, Humanities New York, um, as with so many nonprofits, is as affected by this pandemic as everyone. Please know they are accepting donations. They do require grants from New York State. Please be aware of this. Please help them in whatever way you can. And please subscribe to some of the other offerings that they have. Just wanted to put that plug in there. So as mentioned, um, we do have, um, I do have one email that I would like for us to discuss when it comes to this passage from Alexis de Tocqueville and when it comes to revolutions of the world. It's a passage from volume two, chapter 21, specifically regarding how Alexis de Tocqueville believed that there will be no more, there's gonna be fewer great revolutions in the world, by which he's probably referring to something like the American Revolution and the French Revolution. A uh, case could be made that he may or may not have been referring to something like the Haitian Revolution. And uh, I guess a case could be made that um, when he's talking about great revolutions, something like the Russian Revolution would definitely fall under that uh, definition. But nevertheless, the passage over here that I'm going to quickly have before we go into the commentary, unless it's to talk, Bill writes, if ever America undergoes great revolutions, it will be brought about by the presence of the black race on the soil of the United States. That is to say, they will owe their origin not to the equality, but to the inequality of conditions. Again, going back to what he's always talked about from the very first lines of volume one of Democracy in America, the equality of conditions, what he's talking about over here can clearly be a sign of what's going to be the next great revolution in American history, which is going to be the Civil War. So the passage over here, it's interesting. Um, I believe it was Andrew, you sent me this email. Um, the email just consists of a few comments that were added to Tocqueville's writing. So I'm gonna very quickly read it. Tocqueville's uh, passages are written in white and Andrew's comments are written in red. I'll quickly read this. I hear it said that it is in the nature and the habits of democracies to be constantly changing their opinions and feelings. This may be true of small democratic nations, like those of the ancient world, in which the whole community could be assembled in a public place and then excited at will by an orator. And of course, Andrew commented, uh, which makes me think of Hitler uh, gathering the multitudes in summers to Nuremberg. Uh, if anyone is interested, um, Princeton University Press has a great collection when it comes to words of wisdom from the ancient world. And one of them, I believe, is Thucydides has um, some of uh, Sophocles' comments when it comes to going to war. And it's, like I said, just came out from Princeton University Press, and the focus is specifically on warfare. Highly recommended. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And um, it does continue uh, what Tocqueville is talking about over here, this gathering in a public place and being excited by an orator. But I saw nothing of the kind among the great democratic people that dwells upon the opposite shores of the Atlantic Ocean. What struck me in the United States was the difficulty of shaking, of shaking the majority in an opinion once conceived or drawing it off from a leader once adopted. Neither speaking nor writing can accomplish it. Nothing but experience will avail and even experience must be repeated. To which Andrew comments, but this doesn't anticipate cell phones or Twitter, uh, where many can be digitally gathered at little cost and falsely orated. Very true. Same could also be said when it comes to Zoom meetings like this, or when it comes to web chats, uh, web forums, web pages. Um, what's the word? Um, yeah, web forums, things such as that. I will. I will comment on this when it comes to Tocqueville. 
there were very there was one form of gathering which without a doubt could be uh, was influential at the time and was widespread and those were church gatherings that's where many people would be able to um, meet frequently and um, receive digest information uh, it's also worth mentioning though they did have lyceums during this time period a lyceum is a little bit of an antiquated term. It was basically a place where you could go to to hear speeches that were delivered live. Abraham Lincoln, his first famous speech was delivered when he was 29 years old at a Young Men's Lyceum. He gave an address on the perpetuation of the Union and highly recommend it. It's one of his longer speeches, but it's a wonderful passage over there. I particularly enjoy how there's a few passages that he uses almost verbatim years later in his career. So I highly recommend that. But um, I, I do want to say, though, when it comes to, say, what we do have right now, when it comes to uh, great writing in public uh, places, there is one thing that is very consequential in American history when it comes to simply giving speeches. I'm sure we could look to certain speeches in our lifetime that um, of course, famous speeches like Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and consequential speeches such as Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, request that Congress declare war on uh, the Empire of Japan during World War II. But we do see instances, a few instances in American history, where some people did give speeches that completely whipped up a crowd into a response that did have national consequences. Uh, one of the most famous examples was the Cross of Gold speech by William Jennings Bryan in the late 1890s when he was running for president against uh, William McKinley back in, 19, I'm sorry, 1896. If anyone is interested, this speech by William Jennings Bryan, we actually have a recording of it, if you can believe it. And um, you can go online. And um, the great thing about it is William Jennings Bryan was a very famous orator. And um, he was actually one of the inspirations for the... Um, the attorney in Inherit the Wind, so um, very famous uh, order. And so he did make an effort to deliver the recording similar to how he delivered the Cross of Gold speech. But um, at the end of the day, what I'm getting at is when it comes to the telegraph, we do see a beginning of not only the internet, but also we basically see evidence of human psychology that hasn't changed when it comes to mass communication. And one of the best examples, if any of you are interested, uh, Chris, I'm sure your library either has this or I recommend it, is a book called The Victorian Internet, which is all about what life was like in the 19th century when it came to the use of the telegraph. And it's fantastic. People had love affairs over the telegraph, spam, like you know, advertisements that were unsolicited were sent by uh, telegraph. And there was also um, things that we would now call emojis being sent using uh, the telegraph. So I do actually think that when it comes to uh, what he is talking about over here, we do see in American history during William, I mean, during um, Tocqueville's time, as well as the president, et cetera, that there were opportunities for public gathering to have a great consequence on a population. The only thing is because the United States is such an enormous country and spreading out so far, we, the larger the United States become, the less impact some of those speeches might have. And as I said, that said, William Jennings Bryan is an excellent example. It's a little bit of a counter to what Tocqueville is talking about. Although Tocqueville could just respond that William Jennings Bryan was an unsuccessful presidential can, uh, candidate. So maybe while it was very influential, it was something that was ultimately um, burned a little too, a little bit too brightly before it flicked it out. Andrew, you sent us this for discussion. Do you have any final comments on it before we get to the, the meet of today? No problem. Thank you very much for submitting this. And um, if you have any, if you do um, wish to throw out anything else about what you wrote, just interrupt me while I'm speaking. I know it sometimes takes a while to unmute yourselves. So moving forward, when it comes to our final discussion today, we're going to be going into two parts, which is going to be ideals and uh, morals. And I apologize for the typo over here. That should be uh, morals, not mores. And, um, ah, Andrew. 
My pleasure. So when it comes to the influence of democracy on morals properly so-called, William, um, William Jennings Bryan, I'm sorry, Alexis de Tocqueville starts by saying, in democratic ages, men rarely sacrifice themselves for another, but they show a general compassion for all the human race. One never sees them inflict pointless suffering, and they are glad to relieve the sorrows of others, which they can do so without much trouble to themselves. They are not disinterested, but they are gentle. Let's challenge this right now. Now, one of the great, um, of course, one of the great arguments of our time right now is not the effectiveness of masks when it comes to combating COVID, but whether one should even wear masks. Like, is the individual liberty to wear a mask or not wear a mask? Is that liberty itself uh, uncompromising when it comes to the welfare of those around us? Uh, Vice President, well, President-elect Biden made it very clear that every American should be wearing masks. Donald Trump uh, echoed in the debates that it's important to wear masks while we heard some things to the contrary elsewhere. So I'll put it out there. When it comes to the debate that we have right now over whether to wear masks, do you think that is a sign of the health of our democracy, that there's disagreement? Or do you think such disagreement is healthy in democracy? Please respond to chat or feel free to unmute yourselves and offer your thoughts. No thoughts? Right. Douglas says disagreement is healthy. Douglas, would you care to expand upon that? Won't be judged, just curious. It's good to have a choice. It's good to understand why you have a mask. I like it to protect myself and others. Other people don't feel comfortable. Truthfully, I feel comfortable being at home if I don't have to leave. But if mm -hmm. I do have to leave, if I'm walking by myself, I won't wear a mask. If I come up against another person, I will wear my mask because that's the way I care about the next human being. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for offering that and for what you are doing. Um, Andrew writes, people hated seatbelts but took years to adapt the epidermal contact of masks by government um, edict is too abrupt. Uh, Andrew just wrote that. Any other comments? Oh, thank you very much, everyone who offered an opinion. Continuing on, Toko writes, what I have here remarked of individuals is to a certain extent applicable to nations. When each nation has its distinct opinions, beliefs, laws, and customs, it looks upon itself as the whole of mankind and is moved by no sorrows but its own. Should war break out between two nations animated by this feeling, it is sure to be waged with great cruelty. As nations become more like each other, they become reciprocally more compassionate and the laws of nations is midgetated. This is a very interesting comment in my opinion, because with respect to what we were just discussing before when it comes to masks, it seems over here that national, basically, a unified national identity or pride is something that is conducive for looking out for each other, basically keeping everybody strong. The idea of a, a, a national pride when it comes to maintaining health, having mail be delivered on time, having snow being plowed and garbage picked up. In your opinion, do you believe that the debate that we have today over wearing masks, do you believe that that is a symptom of division in the United States? Or do you think it's something that is a product merely of just our democratic institutions? What are your thoughts? Has the lack of uniformity among the American people basically provided fertilizer for this disagreement over wearing masks? I think because of the uh seriousness of this disease that the discussion over whether or not to wear a mask is rather childish 
and perhaps that's not the right word, but uh, I would think, I think it, it, it just becomes a necessity because of the, the seriousness of people dying from this disease. And I, I find it very strange we're even having this discussion about whether or not you should wear a mask. It seems rather immaterial. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for offering that. Um, let's see, while you were writing that, we got two comments. I'm reading from Matthew. It was a lot of things, lack of leadership, changing information, um, politics. And from Douglas, we have symptom of division. Andrew writes, ridiculous conflict between Macedonia and the similarly named Greek, uh, Greek county settled peacefully. Uh, does, uh, do the three of you, uh, Lisa also writes, I think it's a symptom of division. It seems as the conflict has been driven by the president who doesn't want to be told what to do. Do the four of you um, have anything that you would like to expand upon that? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Not? Oh, yes, go on. It's, it's, it's common sense. It's, for me, it's like my mother taught me that take care of yourself when you have a cold, eat your chicken soup, and stay under the cover. To mm -hmm. me, it was a common sense thing. It didn't seem like I was going to hurt anybody by wearing a mask. So that's mm -hmm. what it was. I wasn't hurting the next human being or myself. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. And let's see, um, Derek also threw something in here. Uh, wrote, I agree with Lisa. Um, again, uh, anyone else who submitted that? Um, any additional comments before we move past this slide? Yeah, this is Lisa. Um, I, I honestly believe that if the president had worn masks and told people to wear masks, that we wouldn't be having this discussion. <laughs> people would be wearing them. I, and, you know, he made a point of taking off his mask, like when he got out of the car and went back to the White House after he had COVID and probably still had it. And Mike Pence made a point, you know, of not wearing a mask and his wife not wearing a mask when they were on stage. I just don't understand it, but I think that's what's driven some of the conflict. It is interesting that um, if you remember, I know that every single, I know the expression is a week is a year in politics. And it seems like this year so far has been 40 years long, it probably feels like. You might remember that very early on, there was a little bit of debate over wearing masks in general on both sides of the uh, political spectrum. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the first, I remember that when it came to President Trump wearing a mask, that uh, he didn't want to be photographed wearing a mask, but there were talks that he was wearing a mask, was not wearing a mask. If I remember correctly, I think it was President-elect Biden, I believe he first prominently was seen wearing a mask on Memorial Day, if I'm not mistaken. Do I have that wrong? I believe he was at a graveyard. I believe he was visiting his um, late son, uh, Bo, and he was wearing his black aviators and a jet black mask. What's interesting about that is from a political point of view, what I can say is that um, visibility in politics is something which is an entire science on its own, be it yard signs, be it um, whether or not to wear a ribbon, certain things like that. And even though something like a mask uh, did not need to be pol uh, politicized, it looks like wearing a mask did become politicized. And it seems that ultimately case could be made that um, while there was and remains division over whether or not to be wearing a mask, that ultimately the winning presidential candidate in this election did choose very ostentatiously to wear a mask, possibly leading by example. I have two comments over here, one from Kristen. Uh, is this why FDR was not photographed in the wheelchair? Um, naturally, when it came to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was um, stricken with polio, um, it, was, it was twofold. One, as mentioned, he did not want to be photographed in a wheelchair uh, for many reasons. Doris Kearns Goodwin has written about it much more eloquently than I have. And of course, we're not too far away from Hyde Park where they have plenty of scholars that can answer that question. Hopefully they can answer them for us in person sometime soon. But um, what I can say is, uh, yeah, we do have some photographs of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I recently saw one video that was released of him very briefly um, 
being wheeled. You could only see like a fraction of the top of his head moving. But no, when it did come to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he wanted people to believe that yes, he was in a wheelchair, but they all he also wanted people to believe that he could, in a way, walk using braces. And it's worth mentioning that he was incredibly physically strong. Like from the uh, his upper body, he did lots of workouts, a whole lot of swimming, and he was able to create the illusion of walking by having braces on his legs, having a cane. And having uh, one person, usually his son, holding him by the arm. And he was able to throw his hips left and right to create the illusion of walking, which was one of those few examples in American history of a president just uh, not only leading by example, but doing something that uh, required incredible physical endurance, not only for the strength to do that, but also to withstand the pain of what he was doing. Mm. As I said, if anyone is interested, please read um, any of the histories on FDR. Doris Kearns Goodwin's writing, of course, on the Roosevelt's highly recommend that. And Randy writes, um, it was used as a prop to create division this time. Everything I've read about the 1918 pandemic is that the mass debate was alive and well then as it is now. So maybe it is something about our political culture. Well, I mean, one thing I could say is that as Tocqueville was talking about over here, that when a nation is distinct and unified and it has a national identity, they're gonna be viewing that identity as the whole of mankind. And when it comes to 1918, women were not able to vote yet. I mean, when it came to um, Jim Crow laws, we still had millions of African-Americans throughout the South that were not able to vote throughout the country, I should clarify, uh, due to um, uh, Jim Crow laws. There was still enormous economic division within the United States, uh, immigration, and rights, and uh, housing, like the FDA had just recently been uh, passed. The case could be made that we were an incredibly divided country then as we are now. And such division is something that does come into conflict with the uniformity of an image of a nation. And thus what Tocqueville, called, uh, what Tocqueville mentions the idea of these people looking upon themselves as the whole of mankind. So Tocqueville adds, going ahead a few chapters to the education of young women in the United States. No free communities ever existed without morals. And as I observed in the former part of this work, morals are the work of women. Hmm. Any comments on that? <laughs> Well, that's good news. <laughs> Please expand upon that. <laughs> if, uh, if morals are the work of women, uh, we're in good shape in this country. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask, um, what more could be done in your opinion? Any thoughts? This, is, this is Gail. I think that what more could be done is that the morals could be the work of all. Uh, I, I think that this probably came out of women raising their children um, mm. and raising their sons to be the kind of men that would be leaders at that time in the country. But our lesson for today and for equality is that we need to be um, all raising all of our children to um, be civil and to respect one another and to respect that there is a government that makes rules and that we need to abide by. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Matthew over here writes, I think that is a great quote and very true. There has to be a general sense of right and wrong and maybe the woman's touch is undervalued. Um, one thing I can definitely say, um, not only are we going to be having our first um, female uh, vice president inaugurated in a few months, but it is worth mentioning that there have been plenty of writings when it came to how different countries with female heads of state handled COVID as opposed to those around the world with, male, uh, with men as the, the head of state. And Matthew writes that actually, uh, oh, this is Teresa. Oh, Matthew's my son. All right, I'll make a note of that. Sorry, Teresa. Thank you for clarifying it. And thus the moral art continues. Thank you so much. 
So long before, and again, continuing the same chapter, long before an American girl arrives at the age of marriage, her emancipation from maternal control begins. She has scarcely ceased to be a child when she already thinks of herself, speaks with freedom, and acts on her own impulse. Even amidst the independence of early youth, an American woman is always mistress of herself. She indulges in all permitted pleasures without yielding herself up to any of them. Oh, let me go back, that was the last of that. Does this surprise you to read it all from a document approaching its second century in terms of its age? I, I can't believe this statement. I can't believe that a man would know enough to write about what a woman thinks. And given that women were considered part of the household and second to their husband and part of the property in so many ways, I don't understand how he comes to this conclusion that they were so free and independent. Mm -hmm. Well, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so who said I agree? Please continue. I, I agree with what she said. She, she stated it beautifully. I think women, uh, certainly in this time, they had a tough role as far as uh, uh, their role in America. They didn't have the vote. Uh, you know, they, um, the woman before me, I thought, stated it uh, quite, quite uh, accurately. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm amazed that he, he felt this way at this time in our history. Mm -hmm. I have a question. In your opinion, uh, your opinions, I should say, do you feel that this is applicable today or no? Well, I think now, yes. I think my generation, I'm 88, I think my generation, and also I think my mother's generation, uh, women became more independent. Mm -hmm and uh, able to be themselves, to become educated uh, and be their, their own selves. Uh, mm. Look, it's 2020 and we still have plenty of glass ceilings. Women still don't earn the same amount of money as men doing the same jobs. Mm -hmm. So we maybe we've come a long way, baby, but there's still a long way to go. So in terms of the pleasures that they choose, you know, I, I think there's a disproportionate uh, responsibility on women to um, even still, even in very equal households, to be responsible for not only their jobs, but their household and raising their children and now homeschooling their children. Um, it is partnered certainly in many, many households, but I think that a lot of that burden does fall on women and also they have a responsibility more so um, to, or expectation more so to care for the elderly in their family as well. So I'm not sure that they equally have the chance to indulge in permitted pleasures as much as perhaps the more aristocratic women that he was dealing with at that time. Thank you so much. Um, just very quickly, I'm going to read some of the comments that were um, added. Uh, during this discussion? Uh, yes, yeah, so Kristen writes, um, if I am correct, uh, women could not have a bank account without their husband's permission until the 1970s. Um, I actually um, didn't know that. I, I can confirm that, but that does sound um, pretty accurate. Uh, if anyone um, has a web browser on, feel free to Google that. Let's, let's find out a little bit more about that. I would like to know. Just drop whatever you find in the chat. Uh, Lisa writes, uh, what was his inspiration for the statement? Is there some objective evidence to support this, especially for women of modest means? Uh, when it comes to the methodology of Tocqueville, he would have asked a lot of questions for those around him, uh, the Americans around him. And um, without a doubt, he most likely would have asked a lot more of men than of women when it comes to the state of uh, men in the United States. Uh, Matthew writes that, um, uh, going back to a previous question, um, Maybe it speaks to the pioneering part of the country. Um, that is interesting when it comes to women getting the rights to vote. Um, I believe I mentioned this last class that 
it was actually um, prostitutes over in the far west, um, women who went west and were um, owning their own basically bordellos. They had land, they had wealth, they were able to invest money into towns, into uh, what was it, into schools, and they eventually were able to help elect politicians that would give them more rights than they had in the other states. So there is a pioneering aspect of this worth mentioning. Of course, that is about um, roughly about 60 years or 50 to 60 years after this was written. Uh, Susan, I want I was saving this for a while. Susan, don't think that I was going to miss this. If he had experience at being a woman, he would not have written this. Very interesting. Mm. And uh, Susan expanded on um, writing, uh, despite the legal and political and social gains of society, women are still treated as exceptions to everything. They are historically the exception in the law, exception in the labor market, exception in properties, etc. And um, Matthew looks like did a little digging, uh, 1960s for the bank account. I knew this was true in France, but did not realize it was true here too. Thank you for checking on that. At the time that he was writing, can you tell us a little bit about his personal life? Was he in a relationship with a woman? Was he courting a woman? Was he in a relationship with a man? What, what was going on in his personal life? Very good question. Uh, when it came to his personal life, um, we, do know that, um, we do know that one of the most important women in his life was his mother. He um, spent a lot of time with her in his youth. He, a lot of his uh, religion, uh, he was indebted to his mother for that. I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, and I'm actually embarrassed to say, uh, I don't know if he married. And um, I guess I could, let me just quickly check over here. I'm going to get you the answer. I, I see on Wikipedia, on my little Wikipedia here, that it says yeah. his spouse was Mary Motley, married 1835 to 1859, mm -hmm. which is when he died. So he got married, all right, yes. And um, yeah, I do know that he was very sickly his entire life. And I don't know if that affected anything when it came to his uh, courtships or anything like that. Uh, yeah, the short answer is I don't know. And that is a very good question uh, when it comes to his personal life. Uh, what I can say is when it comes to his personal life up to the publishing of Democracy in America, uh, that's that one book that I highly recommend, Tocqueville in America. And um, I do apologize that I don't have that information on there. Um, I, I have a question. Um, in the mid 1850s, and I know, I believe, um, my, some of my ancestors came from England and I know the women and the children worked in the mills as well. So I think there are times when women were in the fields, they weren't, I don't know. And I, this is my first time in this class because I didn't pay attention and I missed the others, but, um, <laughs> I, I wonder if he saw people and he was with people who were the, the working poor or the, just the regular normal people, or if he spent time mostly with the aristocracy, because I think people worked, women got dirty and worked too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well, when it comes to Alexis de Tocqueville, he observed all different types of Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, not only that, when it came to uh, slaves and um, the non-enslaved when it came to men versus women, when it comes to the wealthy, the northerners, the southerners, he did see a very good case study of the entire country. Mm -hmm. And there's one story about him, possibly apocryphal. I don't know off the top of my head if this was true, but there was one story that it does capture a little bit of what his journeys were like. I believe he was in New Orleans or he was somewhere in the deep south. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, and again, Full disclosure, the story could be apocryphal. But I remember coming across in my research that he, Alexis de Tocqueville went to a theater. And while he was at the theater, he saw um, basically how almost all of the slaves that were there were, of course, in the very, very, very back. And uh, he was curious because he did see um, one Black woman who was very in a seat of prominence and was curious about who she was. And I think um, it was explained that um, she's not a slave. She was a, a guest from another country. And I think she was uh, either from Haiti or she had some sort of, she had some sort of esteem behind her that gave her, I guess you could call it the societal credentials to be where she was. 
And so he thought that, that was a very interesting um, little bit of like a disharmony with the social norm that was there. That's the kind of observations that Alessio de Tocqueville did a whole lot. Of. Just the kind of things where uh, today, in, in my own experience, I learned quite a lot. I spent a little bit of time in Russia in 2009, in the beginning of the year. And uh, while I was there, I was able to learn quite a lot about public transportation in Russia and also job opportunities just by standing at an intersection for several uh, minutes. This was before we had Uber over in the United States. And when I was standing in Russia waiting for a bus, um, several taxis passed me, several basically Ubers that were uh, basically privately owned vans. That was basically like a mini school bus. And I basically saw that um, in the United States, we would have two or three different forms of public transportation waiting to help someone at a corner. And when I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, there was something like five or 10 of them, which in my mind meant, wow, that means a lot more people are able to work. A lot more people are able to travel even during unfriendly uh, weather conditions, which I found very, very interesting. So it's those kind of observations that Tocqueville would be using when it came to formulating his own writings. And um, he, he was very curious and observant and I guess we could call it a little bit nerdy in that sense when it came to his observations, but the product of it is democracy in America. And again, Tocqueville in America, that's all the background for all of it. It's like I said, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head if uh, that story was apocryphal, simply because Tocqueville in America is, for those of you who might have checked it out from the library, Tocqueville in America is a very, very, very long book with incredibly large pages and very, very small print. So it's probably like hundreds of thousands of words in there. I remember that story, don't remember if it was true. But continuing on here with um, the young woman as a wife, in America, the independence of woman is irrevocably lost in the bonds of matrimony. If an unmarried woman is less constrained than elsewhere, a wife is subjected to stricter obligations. The former makes her father's house an abode of freedom and of pleasure. The latter lives in the home of her husband as if it was <clears throat> a cluster. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Yet these two different conditions of life are perhaps not so contrary as may be supposed. And it is nature that the American woman should pass through the other to arrive at the other. In the United States, the inexorable opinion of the public carefully circumscribes woman within the narrow circle of domestic interests and duties and forbids her to step beyond it. So this is basically his report on, at the time period, a rather unfortunately faithful depiction of married life for women in the United States and how much of the independence enjoying the home when someone is a young unmarried woman is very quickly. If anyone has any comments, feel free to throw them out here while we're on this slide. I um I think it's pretty interesting and and almost going back to what we were just talking about, how typically when when people are subjugated, it's um, you know, the argument has always been, oh, it's it's in their best interest. It's almost like even in the United States, women were looked at as a protected class, right? Like, oh, they don't need to. Uh, work because they're, you know, it's in their best interest, even though clearly it wasn't, right? Women obviously have the same desires, goals, and, and drives that men do. Um, but the same was the argument for slavery, right? Well, this is the, this condition is best for them. Um, and I think that that's sort of how it's been throughout American history. And even as uh, Tocqueville's writing this, as he's going through this, um, you know, this nation that's just sort of being built, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that, like, universal male suffrage didn't happen until the 1840s. Um, so it was almost as if throughout I just want history, to clarify, universal white male suffrage. Just want to white male suffrage, yes, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting case study in how through as we progress, it's, it's almost like we're constantly trying to uh, be better. And I think that this is just an example of uh, how things were, right? You know, women marry into a family, the man takes um, 
you know, the, the property takes ownership over um, any possessions that the woman has. And that's sort of the way it is, because that's uh, what's best for women, even though that that wasn't really the case. But also, I think we have to look at the entire world that's going on, uh, not only in this country, but certainly in France and Europe. And women have, have for centuries been designated to domestic being a domestic uh, object of the family. I mean, that there's nothing new in this, I don't think, because the history of women uh, throughout civilization, that has been their role. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Child care is right there in the middle of it. Can you say it again, just a little more clearly, please? Child care is right in the middle of it. Child, all right, child care is right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, all of you, if you are interested, um, uh, one artifact that I would actually recommend if anyone is interested is uh, what's considered the most famous Southern diarist during the American Civil War. And he was Mary Chestnut. And in her diary kept during the Civil War, if any of you saw Ken Burns's the Civil War documentary, they do reference it uh, quite frequently. She does give a fantastic disclosure of so many of the societal norms of the relationships between men and women during the American Civil War in the South. And in some cases, her celebration of it, and in many her abject disgust with the hypocrisy of it. So if anyone is interested, um, Mary Chestnut, her work, uh, her Civil War diary. It's a lot of reading, but it's fantastic. It's the closest thing we have to basically a time machine to see how the Civil War was for a white woman in the South. Uh, Andrew wrote, uh, the narrow circle of domestic interests is a huge chunk of life. Uh, beyond it lies a strained world of male work. And one thing I do want to mention when it came to um, the subjugated, uh, basically pontificating that it's in the best interest uh, to rule those who are ruled. Uh, it is worth mentioning that not only did that apply to women, but of course also when it came to slaves as well, uh, even when it came to followers of religion as well, or even the subjects of absolute monarchs during this time period. So it is pretty universal that tactic, that it's better off for you or so-and-so to be in charge of everyone. So this is from chapter 12, Equality of the Sexes in the US. Uh, but you weren't expecting Tocqueville to spend so much time writing about this. It's always interesting. So he writes, in America, more than anywhere else in the world, care has been taken constantly to trace clearly distinct spheres of action for the two sexes. And both are required to keep in step. But along paths that are never the same, I have no hesitation in saying that although the American woman never leaves her domestic sphere and is in some respects very dependent within it, nowhere does she enjoy a higher station. And if anyone asks me what I think the chief cause of the extraordinary prosperity and growing power of this nation, I should answer that it is due to the superiority of their women. Mm which does uh, very closely, uh, it co complements a little bit. Our Andrew's comment, the uh, chat uh, does reference this as well when it comes to circles. Any comments on this? You're welcome. Say it again, please. Honey. It would be yummy. I'm sorry, we're not able to hear you. Can you say that again a little more loudly? Well, it's good to hear he thought we were superior. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of a interesting, you know, not to make fun of it, but uh, uh, he he's saying that the women are superior, mm -hmm. uh, which is positive. 
Well, what we can say for sure is based on his own writings of what we've seen before, that um, he could, I mean, he does say that morality is a product of women. So at the very least, we know that he's saying that they're morally superior to men. And thus, um, this morality might be part of the reason why the Americans are such a successful people during this time period. And is women it- put on a pedestal. They're put on a pedestal just like the Statue of Liberty. Uh-huh. A nice French gift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is worth mentioning that when it comes to um, not just the Statue of Liberty, which of course comes later, but just the image of America, uh, Mistress Columbia, as she was known as, uh, she was always just, you know, illustrated as a woman that uh, sometimes she'd be shown as a school teacher, uh, other times. Um, very early on, she would be um, dressed as a Native American woman wearing a headdress. But one way or another, she is always meant to be a figurehead of some higher achievement, learning more, exploring more, discovering more, um, basically um, offering more to the people around them. This idea of plenty, how the United States as a continent offers so much opportunity, granted at the expense of quite a few people, both men and women, when it came to the settlement. Any final comments on this passage before we go to the next? Does anyone have any uh, any ideas? I mean, we are a new nation, and men and women had to work together to be successful. And I, I would like to hear comments. That I mean, obviously, he comes to this co- conclusion, but is some of this due to just the need to work together to survive and build a, a, a nation as we know it today. Mm-hmm. So if I have it correctly, what you're asking is that, if I have it correctly, what you're asking is, was it the sacrifices of women that made the United States what it is today? Along with the men, I mean, uh, the we are developing a great democracy during these times through all kinds of, of problems, but we come through it together. And I, I'm just throwing it out there uh, when he observes that women in their sphere uh, have a lot of power. But I, th- uh, my, I guess what I'm trying to say, it was through necessity. Mm-hmm. Anyone else uh, care to comment on that? Well, one thing that I will ask, um, I'm sure that you've heard this before. Of course, I've heard it. I agree with it 100%. I'm living proof of it. That, um, well, actually not as much of a proof as I would like to be, but uh, I'm sure you've heard the expression that behind every successful man is a woman. Uh, Christian, I see you nodding your head. Um, anything you'd like to comment on that, put into chat, or you can unmute yourself when it comes to that uh, expression? That fact? I was going to put that in the chat. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you crystal clear. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I was going to put that in the chat earlier, but I didn't know who actually said that. So I didn't want to, you know, put it in without the source. But uh, yeah, no, oftentimes the success of of men is due to the person that's running the, you know, when when um, I think Douglas commented about child care being front and center, um, you know, that, that labor is what allows the other half of the partnership to be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I agree with that statement. Yes. Thank you so much. Anyone else care to expand upon that? Yeah, I will. I mean, I agree with the statement. And I think one of the issues is that, you know, what goes behind, you know, raising a child and, and making, you know, a productive person in the world, it's, it's been devalued because it has been performed by women. And we, we don't put enough value on the effort it takes to raise children, you know, into decent human beings. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I have a passage here in the group chat from Susan. 
Uh, she writes, American survival and growth at this time was helped in part because they were not serfs supporting a large entitled landing class, slaves accepted, as the feudal system had perpetuated in Europe. American workers, oh, I guess, uh, oh, sorry, Americans worked hard, both men and women, and were able to realize the rewards of their own labor. Again, something that there's plenty more writing on. And um, Kristen, I have a question. Were you able to find that one book that I recommended on uh, Votes for Women in University Press? You know, um, I did send it out in the email last week, but I'll double check while you're, while you're talking. Give me one moment. Yes. Again, I highly recommend that, not simply because of its writings on women's suffrage, but because uh, that book, which is a very, very handsome book, I have to mention, it's a large, um, large edition, very nice hardcover with beautiful illustrations in there of um, you know posters and artifacts from the history of women's suffrage. Uh, what I really recommend is that it has four fantastic essays on there when it comes to women throughout the entire United States written from four very, very different perspectives by experts on the subject. I do highly recommend that book. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it's called uh, Votes for Women, just published within the last two years by Princeton University Press. So continuing on here, when it comes to honor in the United States, chapter 18, it is the dissimilarities and inequalities among men which give rise to the notion of honor. As such differences become less, it grows feeble, and when they disappear, it will vanish too. There's an interesting comment on honor coming from Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, the French were, they actually learned, um, uh, thank you so much, Kristen. If anyone is interested, that one book I recommended, uh, Kristen has a hyperlink to it from Princeton. So let's see. In your opinion, is the notion of honor a product of dissimilarity and inequality, maybe the idea of exceptionalism is something that's honorable, or could it be due to a lack of honor, in your opinion? Let's, let's challenge that. Is honor possible in a world with equality? In that case, I'll ask, in this case, I will ask, do you agree that dissimilarity and inequality is what gives rise to the idea of honor? What do I mean by honor? Well, let's go into a little bit more detail for that. Oh, wait, um, I'm not, let me stick with that. Uh, when it comes to honor, I guess um, it could mean several things when it comes to uh, Tocqueville referring it to here. Uh, specifically for this chapter, I believe he's referring to um, the idea of uh, pride, veneration, uh, specifically uh, pride from one's work. Um, oh, Andrew over here throws, um, one definition of honor is great privilege. So must it disappear under equality? Very interesting over there. Very good comment. Um, any other comments along those lines? Feel free to put them into the chat. Well, I guess the case could be made that when it comes to, say, a medallion for honor, let's say, uh, they are meant to be exceptional when it comes to offering them. And um, thank you so much, Kristen. And uh, yes, when it comes to, yes, I mean, it could be saying when it comes to military honor, for let's say, um, it is by definition exceptional. You have a medal of honor, the idea of um, a citation of merit, drawing special attention because of someone who was able to do something extraordinary under such circumstances. This could also be something that is, um, could have happened to the previous generation. Someone being honorable simply because of the family that they formed, because of the family that they came from, because of an ancestor, some sort of great achievement. So I would say together that is, um, I would put that under the umbrella for the definition of honor when it comes to Tocqueville in this chapter. Now going on though, uh, this is, of course, what we were talking about before in the very beginning of the class when it came to Andrew's email. In no other country in the world is the love of property keener or more alert than in the United States. All right, let's challenge this. 
Is America different from other countries when it comes to our love for property? Is there Hi. something? Yes, uh, go on, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Priscilla. I um, Different countries over the years have set up completely differently than in, in America, I think people needed they were developing towns and they were developing hierarchies of who would run the town and and who could and who couldn't and people were able to to be uh, it just goes on and on but people needed land so they could grow food to for their families and i think it was very different in europe even in those days so it was a very different culture and i was thinking about that a, a few minutes ago when you were talking about honor as well and just reading some of the old family histories, people would talk or write about the, my dearest father, the most venerable, fabulous, most Christian, most, 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 most everything, um, you know, came before me and did this and that. And their words were very flowery and honor, honoring people. But uh, land was very important uh, to people then, mm -hmm. I think. Anyone else have a comment on that? I think she's absolutely right. Our our whole history is predicated on go go west, young man, uh, and our developing as the country develops. Uh, we have all those uh, explorations and and different ways of of obtaining property throughout all of all of our states and especially in the Midwest and uh, California. And I think we have different rules and regulations for how we obtain property, but it was certainly of utmost important in the development of the nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says over here, uh, two comments Lisa uh, agrees. Uh, Susan wrote, ownership of land among the masses was uncommon in Europe at that time and before worth mentioning that when it came to the Europeans, the Europeans had already had millennia to settle Europe, unsurprisingly. Whereas when it came to the United States, the Europeans had arrived only a few centuries earlier. So there were still entire frontiers for them to conquer, which of course is done at some expense. And then of course, uh, there's pride in holding on to what they have as a result. Uh, Kristen wrote, uh, people feel strongly about the property up. Oh, Good fences make good neighbors. Uh, of course, you know, don't mess with my car. Yeah, there's nothing more American than that. So, or get off my lawn, something like that. So, yeah, maybe it, maybe it is something in our DNA. Maybe it is inherited. Maybe it is cultural. Uh, Andrew wrote. Uh, oh, Andrew wrote that. I thought this quote was about land speculation. <laughs> it is. And uh, when he came to Derek in 1835. Voting was limited to those white men who own land. And less than 30 years later, we would fight a war over humans as property. Excellent observation. So moving forward in the same chapter, and again, now we did touch upon this a little bit, but I'll read it in detail here. If there ever are great revolutions there, in the United States, they will be caused by the presence of the blacks upon American soil. That is to say, it will not be the equality of social conditions, but rather their inequality, which may give rise thereto. When an opinion has taken root in a democracy and established itself in the minds of the majority, it afterwards persists by itself, needing no effort to maintain it since no one attacks it. Those who are first rejected, oh, those who at first rejected it, are false come in. Oh, what typo in there? Those who are first, no, those who had first rejected it as false, oh, all right, my problem, come in uh, the end to adopt it as accepted. And even those who still at the bottom of their hearts oppose it, keep their views to themselves, taking great care to avoid a dangerous and futile contest. Now, this is a very interesting comment over here when it talks about the power of the majority even if be perceived or maybe even uh, invented through fear or through peer pressure. 
in your, in your opinion, do you believe that we truly are free people when it comes to our opinions? Or do you believe quite a few of our opinions are decided by the people around us? Essentially, in your opinion, is the majority actually the majority? I'm going to throw this out for open discussion for just a few seconds because I'm going to be right back. There's a book I'm going to get. Just came back. Uh, quick thing. Um, were there any comments on this, Kristen? So Douglas chimed in that he he thought that our opinions uh, were somewhat defined by those around us, as opposed mm. to um, us being truly free when it comes to our opinions. Mm. Thank you very much. So um, again, got two more books if anyone is interested for discussion on this. Ah, let me answer these questions first. Uh, Lisa writes, I think there is sometimes pressure to conform. Uh, Andrew writes, silence will not save you it is a protest slogan but it's not clear that objecting will either. Very interesting. If anyone is interesting, uh, this is uh, one of the books that I recommended over here, How to Think About War by Thucydides. Again, this is from the Princeton University Press Collection of An Ancient Guide to Foreign Policy. Full disclosure, you're probably wondering why I'm mentioning Princeton so much. They send me these books and I review them. And as such, I happen to have them. I'm not being paid for my reviews. It's just, during this quarantine, I've been reading a lot of books, and guess what? A good way to read books is if they're literally mailed to you. So I just want to say this is an excellent book when it comes to basically the power of political opinion and how it can be very easily swayed. Because um, in here, when he's going into um, some of the speeches from ancient Greece, specifically Pericles, it's very interesting because you actually see over the course of basically many years, speeches that start off when it comes to Pericles justifying war. Another speech where he talks about holding the course of a war if it's difficult. And then ultimately blaming the population for agreeing with him in the beginning when it came to going to war. So over there, it's very interesting where basically the majority opinion was actually a minority. Opinion. In many cases, a super minority opinion that one person had and was able to share it with so many people. Again, Tocqueville said this is not capable in a country as large as the United States because it was over in ancient Greece, again, right over here, his example, where you would have people gathering in one location and be able to universally be affected by a single speech. Another book that I recommend, again, full disclosure, this is Princeton, is The Loud Minority, Why Protests Matter in American Democracy by Daniel Q. Gillian, who is a professor over at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he's over from the University of Pennsylvania. This book is the greatest analysis I have ever read, quantitative analysis on the impact of protests on, on um, elections in the United States. Again, it's The Loud Minority, uh, some of you are asking in chat, by Daniel Q. Gillian, and it basically completely refutes the whole notion of a silent majority by Richard Nixon. And it does a fantastic job in here when it comes to analyzing protest movements going back to the 1940s. And according to um, Dr. Gillian's um, quantitative analysis, he shows quite convincingly that protest movements throughout the United States, um, and specifically protest movements that had some degree of favorability to them, actually led to increased voter participation in congressional districts where they were had. And he makes a pretty convincing case that um, Black Lives Matter, for example, most likely moved the needle as much as one percentage point towards the um, Democratic candidate, uh, Senator, I'm sorry, um, Secretary Hillary Clinton in 2016. So it is interesting what he has over here. He does show that entire elections, presidential elections have literally been swayed because of protests. So highly recommend that when it comes to um, the minds of the majority, if anyone's interested. 
So again, two good books if you're interested on uh, the minds of the majority and how it could be swayed. How to think about war and the loud minority. I do want to mention, Kristen, um, how to think about war when it comes to Thucydides. Uh, this is that ancient Greek guide that I um, highly recommend when it comes to, um, like this whole collection is fantastic in here. Just some of the books that they have in here. Again, I'm throwing this out there. I'm, I'm taking a commercial just because these are great books. How to think about war from Thucydides. Uh, how to keep your cool, an ancient guide to anger management by Seneca. How to be free, an ancient uh, Greek guide to stoic life by, uh, what is it? Epictus, how am I mispronouncing that? How to be a friend, I have this one by Cicero. How to die by Seneca. How to win an argument by Cicero, that's a good one. Um, how to grow old by Cicero. How to run a country by Cicero. And how to win an election by Cicero. Yeah, and these are great books. I highly recommend it. They're so very fun. I'm sorry, I get distracted like that when I get excited. <laughs> Happens every now and then. In that case, um, I guess that could uh, be an excellent example of the will of the minority over here, uh, hopefully infecting the minds of the majority. I do recommend these books. All right, continuing on here again with this chapter uh, 21 when it comes to revolutions, I cannot help fearing that men may reach a point where they look on even new theory as a danger. Every innovation is a blow in trouble, every social advance as a first step towards revolution, and that they may absolutely refuse to move at all. Very excellent question um, when it comes to, say, the United States right now, is in your opinion, do you believe, all right, my question for everyone right now is, I guess, first of all, I'll keep it very simple. Do you agree with this passage? <laughs> Douglas says yes. Vincent says uh, the Luddites. Do I have that correct? The, the Luddites. The Luddites were the ones that uh, when the factories started making machinery that um, would replace them, they broke in at night and set fires and destroyed the machinery. Excellent. Yes. Uh, it's very interesting. I remember I actually asked my accountant about that. I think he said it's actually a, a uh, a fallacy when it comes to robots replacing people. Like he says, of course, like a robot um, will eventually make certain uh, jobs obsolete. But I think he was saying that in the long run, economically, usually um, more equipment is just going to increase productivity, which is just going to be able to lead to a larger um, production, possibly more people to be hired. Uh, Andrew Riley writes a definition of conservatism. Derek agrees. Susan writes, I think this is a good description of the present religious right. Uh, Susan, would you like to um, expand upon that? Guess not. No problem. Feel free to interrupt at any time if you do, or if you're having any uh, technical difficulties over there. So continuing on, um, oh, Lisa writes, um, there's a lot of truth to it. But the revolution can come in different forms. Also worth mentioning that, um, let me just quickly check where we are. Oh, we got a couple of slides. I might be able to get to all of them. Um, one thing worth mentioning is uh, the, technical, the technological uh, innovation itself could be a revolution. Uh, the cotton gin, for example, was immensely consequential when it came to the profitability of slavery in the South and thus the longevity of it going into the 19th century. Uh, just so you know, if anyone's curious, uh, the gin and cotton gin, it's actually short for engine. And of course, um, Bessemer process, a production of steel, uh, the atomic bomb entering the nuclear age, and of course, the space race. So it's worth mentioning that uh, when it comes to every one of those innovations, of course, there were people that were afraid of whether we should be doing that. It seems that um, with any great discovery, there's going to be people wondering whether that discovery should be is worth the risk involved. So one passage over here I have going to the next chapter on wars and democratic communities. There are two things which a democratic people will always find very difficult, to begin a war and to end it. Again, when it comes to Thucydides, fantastic writings from um, uh, Sophocles when it comes to that, if anyone is interested. Any comments in your opinion? 
is going to war and is any war so difficult to hear? How about this? I'm making it a little difficult. What do you think is harder to do? Start a war or to end a war? Douglas turns to the war in Iraq. Douglas says to end a war is harder. Andrew writes, because uh, we never all agree on either, ending a war. So let's think about what is it about ending a war that's so difficult compared to starting a war? I mean, a war requires lots of moving parts. Sometimes congressional declaration, support of the people, weapons of war to be able to uh, reach the opponent. What is it about ending a war that's so much more difficult than starting one here? Well, I, I think particularly now it's difficult because you don't have decisive victories, right? I mean, in the Civil War, you have generally surrounded and it sort of ends. Now it's um, you know, a war on terrorism, right? Where, you know, that sort of drags on, like, wh when do you declare that over? I think it's, there's much more shade, there's more shades of gray now than there, than there were previously. So I think, I think today in particular, it's much, much more difficult to, to end a war. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I would agree with that as well. I know in Vietnam, I mean, it was considered a quagmire, but our, we know from the Pentagon papers that our officials just would not they would just would not admit that they were losing terribly. They didn't want to be the first American president or officials to lose a war. Um, and John Kerry, I think, memorably spoke during some congressional session saying, how do you ask? It was the Senate Foreign Relations. And he said, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die in Vietnam for a mistake? Like, it's it's so compelling The 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 work on the Pentagon Papers and what they what they knew and what they were willing to, I mean, they almost had a truce and then, you know, Nixon wanted to be reelected or uh, wanted to be elected and was uh, dangling some peace process if he got elected. I mean, we had we had a truce that was possibly tenable and, and it came down to political strate strategy. For those who are interested, um, within the last four years, uh, we do have additional recordings from the Lyndon Johnson Library when it came to Johnson's recordings with respect to the Channel to Pair. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the Channel to Pair was referring to Anne Channel, who was a, a bit of a socialite in South Vietnam, who served as a back channel uh, to the Nixon, uh, what was it, the uh, campaign to elect Richard Nixon in 1968. For a long time, this was considered rumor. They were never able to prove that she was, in fact, uh, funneling information to and from the South Vietnamese. But um, the, the story went that um, she was able to persuade the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, on behalf of the Nixon campaign to not sign a peace treaty, saying that uh, don't have a ceasefire. If Nixon becomes president, you'll be able to enjoy a, um, you know, a better peace deal. And... Uh, Fortunately, within the last few years from uh, Lyndon Johnson's own recordings, we did learn that it was in fact true and that basically Richard Nixon committed what I can quote Lyndon Johnson at least saying that Lyndon Johnson considered treason in order to win a presidential election. So it has happened here and it's in the history books. Andrew Riley writes, let's not forget the Korean War. Lisa writes, uh, you have to do it right. Plan for the post-war government and economic security. So there's no power vacuum that leads to war again. One big example I'm going to throw out there is the American Civil War. In many cases, fighting the war was easier than uh, putting the nation together again. And when it came to fulfilling the aims of the 13th and the 14th, and, uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment which not only took um, 100 years to reach something closer to a more perfect union, but the case could be made that right now they are just as fragile as they have always been. So continuing on, no protracted war can fail to endanger the freedom of a democratic country. Any thoughts on that?
does a prolonged war threaten a democracy? Well, let's think about it. I see uh, Kristen and Douglas agree. We're right now fighting the longest war in American history when it comes to the war in Afghanistan. In your opinion, how has that one war threatened the freedom in the United States? Any comment? Our economy is bad because we have to pay for this war. All right, so we have to pay for the war, which will uh, suffer cutbacks and things such as education that might be more facilitous for a democracy. Uh, Kristen, Douglas, Lisa, all in agreement. Any other thoughts? Kristen, uh, commenting on the, the Department of Defense budget. All right, well, continuing on here, and again, we are going to be wrapping up pretty soon, unfortunately. I did want to go more into, let me just see how many do we have on more. All right, so we're going to finish over here. I am sorry we're not going to be able to um, go through everything. I incorrectly designed this entire program to be five weeks long instead of four weeks. So mea culpa, my mistake on that. But I do want us to discuss right over here, all those who seek to destroy the liberties of a democratic nation ought to know that war is the surest and shortest means to accomplish it. Let's challenge that. When it comes to our democracy, including our democracy right now at this moment, during uh, this time in our nation's history, and including on this date in November, in your opinion, do you believe that whatever threats to our democracy that we might face right now, real and imagined, do you believe that they are a product of war or no? Andrew writes the Japanese internments of World War II. Well, without a doubt, that's um, a horrifying example of uh, how swiftly war can destroy liberty. Uh, what else? Any other thoughts? I think maybe we can think about war as not necessarily a battle with armed forces but a battle between or divisions within a country. Mm -hmm. That's one example, of course. Maybe something almost like a cold civil war, you might say. Lisa writes, I think an uninformed citizen, uh, citizenry is a threat. Tell you what, I'll throw one out there. What if the war is thrust upon us, such as the terrorist attacks of 9-11? That, of course, led to the invasion of Afghanistan in the current war. We are entering the third decade of this century, and we spent the first two decades uh, in their entire, almost in their entirety, fighting a war in Afghanistan that started off with a terrorist attack on the United States. In your opinion, do you believe that threats to our liberties right now in the United States are all ultimately a product of this terrorist attack? Or do you believe it's something older? Can you say that again, Giacomo? Do you believe that threats to our liberty? All right. Do you believe that threats to democracy in America today are ultimately a product of the terrorist attacks in 9-11 and subsequent war? Or do you believe they are a product of something older? I think class war is a bigger deterrent to our democracy mm -hmm. than war with bullets. Mm -hmm. And why so? Tell us. Um, the, the ability of those who have billions of dollars to be able to buy our, the messaging, like Citizens United case, to be able to speak louder than anybody else, their manipulation of the stock market, their um, uh, ability to keep power for themselves by gerrymandering districts and the, the use 
an abuse of money in politics. And I think that completely trickles down to the uh, racial and economic war on people that is existing right now that, you know, is kind of the elephant in the middle of the room in our politics. Anyone else agree or disagree? Is it ultimately just the economic inequality that is the bigger cause of this? Maybe if there's more equality in the United States, there would be less war? Well, maybe something to discuss in a future program. Uh, we are running out of time. Kristen, I know that after 8.30, the library turns into a pumpkin. So I don't want to be keeping you. Do you have, um, well, you're in charge of this. Do you have any final thoughts or anything you want to put out there? Any announcements whatsoever? Uh, well, I, I do want to thank everyone for uh, attending these incredibly vibrant sessions. I enjoy uh, doing these types of uh, participant uh, participatory events where we have um, true engagement where folks as they're comfortable can either you know chime in in the chat or, or unmute themselves. I think the more that we do it, the better we get at it and being comfortable with it. Um, you know because of you know, the way COVID is trending, you know we're going to be seeing more types of programming um, this way on Zoom and I look forward to being able to offer more of them. Um, you had asked earlier earlier, Giacomo, about upcoming programming. I know um, we have an incredible uh, program, a music program. It's called, um, it's one of the, Michael Farley's one of our librarians that does a, a jazz feature where they, uh, it's like an, an album listening um, program. Uh, and we have several book discussion groups uh, throughout November and December. So I encourage you to check some of those out. We don't have one that's, um, you know, Humanities New York funded with Giacomo on deck, but I think that the participation in this one would almost warrant another another go around. So I, I want to take this opportunity to thank Giacomo. It's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, if we could get a round of applause, I know everybody's mute, muted, but a round of applause for Giacomo. Uh, I really appreciate your efforts here. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. It's always it's always a privilege and a pleasure to be um, a part of these. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for offering these. I mean, I'm going to be honest. This is my favorite library to be speaking at in the capital region. It's always wonderful to be um, with you. And you're so engaged. And uh, please just keep this community going. This class is just something to contribute to this community. Please stay plugged in. Please go to these other events. Support these other people that are doing these events. And if you need me for anything, shoot me an email. Have a very safe winter. Hope to see you in the spring. Thank you, Giacomo. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.